Welcome to yet another presentation on landings, and this presentation is going to cover not so much how to land, but what to look for when you are learning how to land in order to understand why you might not be getting the result that you are trying to achieve when you're working on your landings. So we are going to cover some of the following. So we're going to be covering centerline control, crosswind correction, approach airspeed, and why it is important, how to choose it, and how to get it and hold it. We are going to cover a visual phenomenon I like to call chasing the runway. We will cover bounce recovery and porpoising, what causes it and how to recover from it, ballooning, what causes it and how to recover, floating, what causes it and how to recover, and lastly, we will touch on the short field and soft field approach. Before we talk about all of that, however, I will quickly touch on overshooting yet again. A lot of the bad things that can happen in a landing are sometimes caused by trying to force a landing. Now it is true that takeoffs are optional, but landings are mandatory. So at some point, a landing will be required and you cannot simply overshoot all day long. However, so long as there is fuel in your tank, you cannot hurt yourself by going around and trying again if you end up uh, experiencing a bad approach. One important thing to remember, especially during an overshoot, is the pilot order of operations. So you have first aviate, then navigate, then communicate. So get full power in and start flying the plane again and getting the flaps all cleaned up. Know where your circuit is and where you will be going next. And then lastly, advise tower that you are overshooting. And so now, since you've done plenty of slow flight recoveries in the practice area, I want you to think of an overshoot in the same way. So it is full power, car feet off, keep that nose from popping up, maintain directional yaw control, uh, regain your airspeed, bring your flaps up in stages, return to a climb attitude, and then return to the normal circuit pattern following all noise abatement and circuit pattern rules. Remember that during a go around, you may have the natural tendency to want to pull the nose up seeking altitude, but remember that an airplane cannot climb until it can fly, and it cannot fly below your stall speed. So remember that the nose needs to be lowered briefly to about slightly higher than cruise, to regain airspeed, and if you are low enough, you'll also have ground effect to help you keep. So keep it level until you've got at least your short field rotation speed. And since a picture is worth a lot, this one from the FAA demonstrates the flight pattern of an overshoot quite well. Full power, airspeed, climb, clean up flaps, and continue on. So now that we have touched on overshoots, let's take a look at what else can get messy in the landing. The first thing that you'll run into once you have turned base to final is centerline control, how to get it and how to keep it. This is critically important to obtain way back in the approach and to hold it all the way down so that you're not trying to fix it on short final. So aileron and rudder, which does what? So I often like to think aileron for centerline and rudder keeps straight. So when on approach to landing, the ailerons help to steer us onto the runway, but it is the rudder that keeps the nose of the aircraft in line with the center line and not the ailerons. Also remember that as your airspeed decreases, your ailerons become less and less effective, and it is actually your rudder that has most of the authority, similar to in slow flight. This is especially true on short final and throughout the flare. So I'm sure you have seen this before on landing and thought, huh, this looks weird, and you're right, because it looks like you're sort of trying to land there, but you're actually lined up to land kind of right there. So the best thing to do in this case is to get right back on that center line and use the ailerons and rudder combined to bring the aircraft back in line with the center line, and then use the rudder to keep that center line in front of you. Here is another example. It looks pretty uncomfortable, right? So if you can see those runway lines are actually at an angle. So then that's kind of how you know that you're gonna to have to fight to steer back onto that center line because you're wanting to land right about there at this point. In this case here, you're actually pretty lined up with the center line, but it's the nose of the aircraft that is not uh, straight in line with the runway. So this is the rudder's job, um, right? To keep that center line right in front of you. So use the rudder to keep straight. If you find yourself in this situation where you're fighting a crosswind with the aileron and are crabbing towards the runway, this is where you can enter a side slip in order to maintain directional control down that runway. 
It is possible to crab all the way down to the threshold, but it makes the recovery to the flare rather messy. And also your approach is going to look quite strange from what you're used to. So let's now talk about the crosswind correction where you're using both the aileron and the rudder to stay on your glide path. So I do recommend that you go back and review the video lesson on slips, but here is one slide for a quick reference on how to enter a side slip. First, offset your heading by turning into the wind, then apply opposite rudder as required. Make sure that the nose does not come up too much and really hold your airspeed. Maintain these inputs for as long as needed or even right up until the landing. So your normal approach might look like this. And remember that the runway is in front of you, not in front of the nose of the airplane. You're lined up on center line and you are nice and straight. Fighting a crosswind might look like this. So you'll be slightly banked into the wind and be applying opposite rudder to prevent the nose from following. Some more notes here on crosswind landings. If you have to execute a crosswind landing, you'll probably be dealing with some gusting winds as well. So you will likely have a slightly higher approach speed and therefore your controls will be slightly more effective on short final. But you will need to work to keep that aircraft on airspeed and on centerline well into the flare. If you are doing touch and goes, Maintain that aileron input in the initial touchdown, but as the aircraft picks up speed, bring them back to a more neutral position as their effectiveness increases. You don't want to steer yourself off the runway. Once you leave the surface, get that aileron input back into the crab and crab the aircraft into the wind and use only as much rudder as needed to check the yaw on departure. Avoid cross controlling with nose high and at low air speeds because it can cause an excessive amount of drag on your aircraft. Now let's talk about airspeed control. And when you think airspeed control on final, I really want you to be thinking about pitch and about trim. If you go back to the lesson on descending, remember that you start a descent by reducing power and then you set the attitude according to the airspeed that you desire and then you trim to maintain that airspeed. So power will control your descent profile, but it is predominantly your pitch that will control your airspeed. The question then arises, what airspeed should my approach speed be? And the answer is the approach speed of your aircraft operating handbook or POH. And you should be able to find that in section four normal procedures. So don't take my word for it, actually look it up and verify it in the POH so that you can be confident in your answer. The recommended approach airspeed will also likely vary depending on whether you have flaps extended or not. For your commercial flight test, you will be asked what airspeed is recommended for the approach in the absence of the POH or manufacturer's recommended approach speed. The answer is in the absence of those, the POH or the manufacturer's recommended airspeed, a speed equal to 1.3 times the flaps out stall speed should be used. Lastly, a good rule of thumb when landing in gusty conditions is to increase your airspeed by half, half the gust factor. Thus, if wind is 10 gusting 20, then since 20 is 10 knots higher than the wind speed, you should add half of that or five knots to your approach speed. The reason for this is that since you are very close to the airplane's stall speed, you don't want to risk losing lift in the event that you suddenly lo lose a strong wind gust. So the bottom line of all of this is know what your desired airspeed is supposed to be, pitch for that airspeed visually, and then trim to relieve control pressure. So now I'm going to talk about a phenomenon that I noticed and I've started calling chasing the runway. And at the same time, I will bring up the point of zero movement. The point of zero movement we spoke about back in the early days of straight and level flying, and that's where you picked a spot way off in the distance and flew towards it. And everything around that object appeared to move away from that specific spot, yet that spot appeared to remain in the same space. Essentially, when you land, you wanna keep that aiming point in that point of zero movement and fly towards it. It might feel weird because you might feel like you are diving towards the runway, 
but you need to keep that aiming point in your point of zero movement. And the more you look for it, the easier it will be to find it. And I encourage you to keep trying to judge where that point is and fly towards it. Now, weird things can start to happen when your aiming point is not at the point of zero movement. For example, if you can see that the runway is starting to look like it's moving up and away from you, the temptation might be to lift the nose and get it back in the same spot. However, this will only have the effect of decreasing your airspeed, bringing you closer to a stall. Similarly, if the runway starts to look like it's going to run under you, the temptation might be to lower the nose to get that point, that threshold or that aiming point into the point of zero movement. However, this will only have the effect of increasing your airspeed and you will need to have to bleed off that energy into the flare. So the proper reaction to both of these situations is to actually add or remove power. Remember that power controls your rate of descent, so it will get you to where you want to be. If you have trimmed for your airspeed and you feel the tendency to want to chase the runway with the nose, then add power if you want to pitch up and remove power if you want to pitch down. And this should help you correct the situation with your glide path. Now let's talk about some sticky situations you can get into on short final. We will start with the bounce and the porpoise, which may result from a flare that it is too little or too late. And before we do, let's take a look at what might happen if caution is not applied when judging your approach and your flare. So a bounce is essentially caused when an airplane carries too much energy downwards into the landing or is essentially dropped onto the runway. The airplane hits the ground and compresses the gear, which the gear happily returns to the aircraft in the form of a vertical push. However, now the airplane is back in the air and is not generating sufficient lift to stay there and will thus fall right back down to the earth for an, another bounce. Due to the force of the bounce lifting the aircraft away from the runway, the instinct could be to push the nose of the aircraft down and towards the runway. The aircraft, however, has very little to zero energy following the bounce and is essentially stalled. The only force getting it back into the air is the energy that is being delivered back to the airplane via the landing gear. Pitching the nose down at this point to try to force the airplane to land will only force the airplane to drop onto the propeller or the nose gear whereas keeping the nose too high will force the airplane to drop onto the main gear. Neither of them is a very good option, so what do we do? Well, I can give you two options. So let's just deconstruct again what happens in the bounce. So removal of power, airplane comes down, not enough flare or flare too late, the airplane bounces and then falls back again to the runway. The first one is to add a touch of power. Now, this might work if the bounce is not too severe and the landing needs to be smoothed out. What adding power does is it essentially generates airflow back over the wings and thus the airplane can settle more softly onto the runway. However, the consequence of trying to save a botched landing is always that your landing rule will be extended. The second option is the go around and this should always be the option taken if the runway is short or the bounce is severe. Do not try to save a landing if you have the option to go around and try it again. Once a landing approach is upended, it might be much harder to try to fix it. Since the airplane has no energy following a bounce, little to no energy, full power must be applied. So just make sure that the nose is slightly higher than level and once safe airspeed is confirmed, bring the flaps up in stages. So for example, you come in for the landing, experience a bounce, add full power at this point, and hopefully just get the airplane flying again and come back in for another try. So now let's discuss the porpoise, which usually develops out of an improper pitch reaction or a lack of flare. So uh, too little black back pressure on the yoke or too late. So a porpoise usually develops from a bounce where the nose and the main gear are not hitting the ground at the same time. The nose strike compresses the oleo and forces the nose of the aircraft back up into the air again. 
A porpoise can be a type of bounce if insufficient flare is given in the landing, or it can develop from a bounce or a balloon if the pilot attempts to correct the landing by forcing the plane nose down onto the runway. Attempting to fight the porpoise oscillation with pitch can potentially aggravate or intensify the oscillation. Recovery from a porpoise requires complete resistance to pitch down and instead adding power and either softening the landing if it is just a minor amount or executing a full go around if it's a more pronounced case. Keep in mind any attempt to add power to save a landing will result in a much longer rollout and should not be attempted on a short runway. Continue to fly the airplane, whether that means you can make the landing safety or whether you need to do a go around. The bottom line is porpoising is usually caused or prolonged by trying to force a landing to happen. Now let's talk about ballooning. Everybody balloons at some point, so it's important to understand why. A simple way to think about a balloon is too much or too fast, or both. But there might be other reasons as to why the airplane might balloon on landing. So a balloon is how we describe a situation where during the flare, the airplane stops, starts to climb back up and balloon away from the runway. Since this tends to eat up most of the remaining energy, the airplane will likely stall at this point and drop down onto the runway if no corrective ac action is taken. So how a balloon develops is too much energy is diverted vertically rather than horizontally, usually as a result of too much pitch in the flare, so too much or too fast. If you are on a normal approach with too much airspeed, which is also energy, you can balloon unexpectedly as the elevator will have more authority or effectiveness at that higher airspeed than you are used to. Once you're in a balloon, your airspeed is rapidly falling as you're moving further and further away from the runway. Your energy tends to bleed off almost completely at the top of the balloon, resulting in a stall back down onto the runway. So now that let's, we've talked about recognition, let's talk about recovery. The best way to recover from a bad balloon is to go around. Basically, you've shot your landing and you need to go back and set up and try again. A good landing is a result of a good approach and a balloon, unfortunately, just tends to destroy a good approach. As we previously discussed, do not attempt to force a landing by pitching down. Similar to a bounce, pitching the airplane down will likely cause the plane to land on its main wheel or prop. Do, however, relax slightly on the control column as you add power, since one possible cause of the balloon was too much back pull on the elevator. You want that nose to be just slightly higher than cruise if you are initiating a go round. And remember that the safe way to overshoot is to add full power regain airspeed and bring flaps up in stages and then continue to climb. So again, recovery is add power, go around, bring flaps up in stages, do not pitch down towards the runway and do relax a little bit on the control column forward to allow the nose to be just slightly more nose up than in cruise when you're doing your overshoot until you regain airspeed and then bring it back up to the climb attitude. Now let's talk about another fun phenomenon, which is floating. A quick summary is too much energy in the landing, but it is actually slightly more complex than that. So if you find yourself in a float, you're okay. Just make sure that the float doesn't turn into a balloon. Floating means that you need to dissipate more energy than usual before your aircraft settles onto that runway. It's usually the result of carrying too much energy into the landing, meaning that your airspeed was likely too high on approach and short final. Keep in mind, however, that floating can occur unexpectedly in gusty conditions too. You might get an unexpected gust that keeps your plane aloft for longer than you anticipated. So be prepared and keep that plane flying down that runway center line. Floating, if well controlled, can turn into a very good landing, but a much longer rollout than expected. If you can sense the aircraft floating and you intend to land on a short runway, consider adding power and initiating a goal round rather than waiting to see how long your landing will take you. Or if you are planning to do a touch and go, plan for a full stop landing instead and taxi off and back onto the runway and advise tower when safely able. So now that we've touched on all these things that you might experience in a landing, let's talk about the flare. And what I want you to think about in the flare is I want you to think about flying the airplane onto the runway. Okay, so but how do I learn how to flare? Well, one of the ways that you could help yourself learn how to flare is to talk your way through it. So there's a script here 
with associated actions that you could use if you wanted to in order to kind of talk yourself through the flare and get your brain engaged with what you're supposed to do at each point. So over the fence and runway assured, that means you probably can judge that you have the ability and the height to glide to that runway threshold, so bring power to idle. Catch the nose drop just basically means if you're removing a significant amount of power, maintain your pitch so that the nose doesn't drop too much. Runway expanding, so this is your visual cue to move your eyes and your focus down the runway. Fly the runway, so this is where you essentially bring the aircraft to a cruise attitude and literally fly down that runway as this is your energy dissipation phase. Feel the sink, so that's when you can tell that you're holding the cruise until you bleed off any excess energy or float, and then nose slightly up. This is your tiny little flare at the end where you bring the nose up slightly to ensure that your main gear make contact with the runway first. So here's a lovely photo from the FAA, which shows the flare, and it really helps to show one thing that I wanna point out. You've probably heard me make reference to the fact that I like to think about both airspeed and altitude as money in the bank and you can exchange one for the other. Once you bring the power back, you maintain that airspeed until you have reached the threshold of the runway. At that point, you can change your angle of attack to give away some of that airspeed in exchange for a bit more altitude, essentially to hold you a couple feet off the runway. And this is why you end up leveling off and flying down the runway until you run out of airspeed. And technically, that should happen right around the time that you are touching down on the runway. So on approach, even though your sink rate is important, your airspeed control gives you very good control over how much energy you're bringing into that landing. Your approach angle might be steep if you're coming in with full flap and no power at all. And your approach angle might be shallow if you're coming in with full flap and a lot of power. Regardless of how you do it, you should aim to end up close to that runway with sufficient altitude but with your airspeed set in accordance to that approach speed for your airplane. This will help you a lot in managing how much energy you bring into that landing. So let's talk about flap for a minute. So flaps reduce your aircraft stall speed and allow you to touch down at a lower airspeed, but this will not make the landing softer, it will only make it slower. The resulting decrease in touchdown airspeed should technically reduce your rollout since you have hypothetically carried less energy into that landing. To attain the proper landing attitude before touching down, the nose must travel through a greater pitch change when flaps are fully extended. This is because when you land with flap, you've trimmed for a much more nose down approach than with, nose, the with no flap. And again, just as we saw in the slow flight exercise, due to the increase in drag from the addition of flaps, more power will be needed when flaps are deployed to maintain the same approach profile. So now that we've looked at all of that, let's take a look at the key differences between a short field and a soft field. Most of the difference is in how you manage your energy. In a soft field landing, you wanna carry energy into that landing to reduce the descent rate to its minimal amount, almost like you're deliberately trying to bring a bit of float into that landing. Keep the flaps in through the rollout and literally keep the airplane flying for as long as possible. If you are losing energy too quickly in the flare, you can even bring in a tiny touch of power just to check your descent and to keep the airplane flying onto the grass. In a short field landing, you will want to carry as little energy as possible into the landing to reduce the ground roll. Essentially, you almost want the airplane to run out of energy right at the point of touchdown. So to get the stall horn on a short field landing should not surprise you as you are flying it down at an airspeed that is just slightly higher than the, approach, than the stall speed. So with both a soft field and a short field, both can be done and should be done with full flap. Both can and should have the same approach speed. The difference is that for a short field, reduce power a little bit sooner to bring out some of that energy. For a soft field, either reduce power a little bit later or you may add a tiny touch of power just after bringing the nose level or just before the flare to keep your airplane flying for as long as possible and touching down with a slight bit of energy in the rollout and keeping the nose of the aircraft as high as possible in the rollout. One last thing I want to talk about is what happens when you remove power on short final. 
And this is a bit of a review from the lesson on strain level flying. Our airplanes are balanced in such a way as that when we remove power, the nose has a tendency to fall. And the airplane is designed this way so that the airplane is almost seeking its previous airspeed, exchanging altitude for it. If you remember this, it will be easy for you to remember that when you remove power on final to prevent that nose from falling, you have already begun to eat away at that airspeed. And if you retain that attitude, your airspeed is going to be bleeding off. So keep power in until you are sure that you will make the runway threshold. And that way you won't be attempting to stretch that glide with pitch. So in conclusion, and the reason I made this entire video was to help you understand the following. If you start the flare too early, you could lose energy and your sink weight rate will increase and may cause you to stall before or onto the runway. If you are too aggressive in the flare, you will divert too much energy upwards and balloon. If your flare is too late or not sufficient, you risk striking the nose gear and starting to porpoise. If you bring too little energy, so too low of an airspeed into the landing, you will lose too much energy in the flare and likely stall or drop into the runway. If you bring too much energy, so a higher airspeed into the landing, you will carry that energy forward and float down the runway. So here are some final tips that I would like to bring to your mind to help you when you are doing your circuits and your landing practice. So tip number one is know your target airspeeds. Tip number two is talk your way through it. Say the same thing at the same time every time and try to Goldilocks in the timing of that flare. Number three is do not panic. Number four is keep flying the plane always. And number five is try to know what to fix, fix it early, and with minor adjustments. I found, especially on final and into short final, any adjustment through time becomes a major adjustment. So if you make your adjustments smaller and earlier, they can actually help to correct you without overcorrecting the problem and then creating an oscillation of adjustments. Excellent, thank you so much and uh, review this video if it helps and see you soon.